markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Hey everyone, what is good? Welcome to the show. Here we are for episode 194. Joining me is Liam Vaughan, finance author and senior reporter for Bloomberg. Liam's latest book is Flash Crash, which tells the story of Navinda Singh Sarau, a London trader living at his parents' house who made $70 million from his bedroom and was later accused by the US government of playing a part in the 2010 flash crash. Just for anyone who is unaware, this was a deeply perplexing event in which the US stock market one afternoon plunged approximately 9% and then almost completely rebounded, all in the space of just 30 minutes or thereabouts. Liam sent me a copy of the book beforehand and it was hard to put down. Truly, he's done an amazing job of the book. And although in this episode, Liam does speak about many interesting moments from Nav's life, from starting out as a prop trader in 2003, through to when he was extradited to the US in 2016, believe me, it is only the tip of the iceberg. The story runs much deeper. Go get yourself a copy of the book. It's available from May 12th, 2020. And if you punch in chatwithtraders.com slash Liam, L-I-A-M, that will redirect you straight to Flash Crash on Amazon. Again, that's chatwithtraders.com slash Liam. All right, please enjoy the episode. I knew a little bit about Nav, like I followed the story very, I wouldn't say very closely, but uh, with a little bit of interest, but I mean, obviously learned so much more about it from reading the book. So let me ask you this question just to get things going here. What compelled you to actually go to all the trouble to speak with all these people and write a book about NAV and the flash crash and the events surrounding it? Yeah, so I've been a a financial journalist for about 15 years. uh, And for the last few years, I write predominantly about white collar crime. You know, a lot of the time you're writing about People who, you know, are very well educated, have gone to investment banks like JP Morgan or UBS and end up getting in situations like, you know, the LIBOR scandal or, you know, the rigging of foreign exchange rates, things like that. Uh, And they're pretty interesting, uh, you know, as a journalist, but the people that you're writing about tend to be of a certain type or you get the other end of the spectrum, which is like straightforward con artists, of which there's a few in my book. (laughs) You know, and they're and they're fun stories as well because these people are just really um, fascinating characters that they're willing to to lie to people and to sort of steal their money, and and that's interesting. You know, in the way that they spend it and stuff. But Nav was just totally, totally unique. Really, he was just such an odd and unusual character. Came from a completely different world, um, and also just the fact that he was a a day trader. You know, he never really had any dealings with any major financial institutions, you know, it was very much on the kind of outskirts of the, the, the the normal world that Bloomberg would write about. And yet he was just brilliant. And, you know, there were so many unanswered questions. Like when I started, right, started looking into the story, there was just so many unanswered questions. Like, did he, was he really a good trader? You know, did, did he, was he just a cheat or was he actually brilliant in in some ways? And did he really cause the flash crash? Because there was so much dispute around that. And as a writer, one of the things you look for in a character is somebody that divides opinion and that he's, he's got nuance. And, and that's the thing about Nav. It's like, if you ask somebody, they might tell you, listen, the guy was cheating. He was spoofing. He knew the rules. He did it anyway. There's nothing brilliant about that. He deserved what was coming to him. But then you ask a lot of other people and they'll say, look at the markets, look at the way the HFTs operate and make money. And you get a guy like Nav who finds a way to to fight back and he's really, really successful. And they, you know, they consider that as as kind of amazing, even if ultimately it was, uh, you know, illegal. So he, you know, he had everything. And then obviously there's all the kind of all the stuff that everyone knew straight away about how he never spent any money and he always wore a tracksuit and he drove a, like he, you know, he, he used to tell people he had a Lambo, but it was actually a, a bright yellow bike with a Lambo sticker on it. And <laughs> <laughs> just a funny, a, a really funny character. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was, I was thinking about 
what sort of questions I would ask you last night, just doing a little bit of prep for this interview. And it was really tricky because in some ways, I don't really want people to get too much. Like I want people to read this book because it was really good. Um, I feel like we'd almost be doing a little bit of a disservice by giving too much away. So um, there's a few points, of course, which I, I'd love to get in. But yeah, let's, let's certainly save some for the book. So we're not going. This is not going to be the comprehensive Nav story. But Nav started as a trader at proprietary firm Futex, uh, which was in London, I believe. Uh, and I actually had um, Dan Goldberg, who was a partner at Futex, on the podcast like years ago. What year did Nav start trading at Futex? And just tell me a little bit about the kind of environment at the time when he came into the firm. Was there anyone sort of influencing his trading? Was he left to his own devices? Did he pick things up fairly easily? Like what was that? What were the early days at Futex like for Nav? Sure. So he um, joined in 2003. It was actually called... I think it was called Independent Derivatives Trading at that point, and they changed their name later. Um, And it was a really interesting time in the sort of evolution of financial markets because futures trading had recently started to kind of migrate from the pits, really. You know, over a long period of time, but particularly in the kind of late 90s, all the pits are closing and increasingly futures trading is moving and migrating onto screens. And at that point, you get all these kind of prop shops and Uh, arcades that spring up. And Nav had recently done a degree, a kind of pretty average university in in London in maths and and computer science. And then there was an advert that was placed in a like a local newspaper. Um, It was like, you know, traders required, you know, must have determination. You know, I can't remember the, the exact criteria. So he applied for an advert like lots of other people and got invited down to quite a modest office, which was above a supermarket um, in a place called Weybridge, which is about 45 minutes outside of London in suburbia. Um, and he was the, one of the second group of intakes that they ever took on. And it was run by a guy who's a pretty colorful character himself called Paolo Rossi. And Dan Goldberg was was also one of the sort of management team. And they were sort of ex-life traders from the pits, you know, sort of East End geezers who had, you know, particularly Paolo, had all this success uh, in the pits uh, and saw an opportunity uh, to hire people. But obviously in the pits, the type of people that you were hiring tended to be, you know, big guys, people with big personalities that could sort of handle the hustle and bustle. But when you're talking about trading on a screen, it's almost like a different, you know, it's the same job, but it's a different skill set. Uh, and and for that, you know, people like Nav, who have got like a photographic memory and all these uh, just innate math skills uh, and ability to sort of process data and information very quickly. Uh, and, and, you know, almost like computer gaming uh, types as well that are very nimble fingered and stuff. Like it really suited, suited guys like that. Um, so Nav was one of the very first people through their door and it was a bit of an experiment at that point in time. And, you know, the impression that I got of the place was that it was a bit rough and ready, you know, that the personnel would come and go and that the train, you know, the training was sort of a, a, mi- a mixed bag, but also it was really fun and exciting time because everyone there was really ambitious. They were all kind of young and all wanted to make it as traders. So they were all kind of helping each other. At that point, it was predominantly focused on trading index futures. Um, and the main sort of strategy that they were doing was was kind of scalping and very short-term trading as opposed to any kind of fundamental analysis or anything like that. I mean, by all accounts, Nav, you know, he didn't immediately take off. But he was good and he was very patient and he had what a lot of people don't have, which is amazing focus. So he could sit there and watch the ladder without placing a trade patiently for hours and hours at a time and pick his spots. And he was, yeah, he, he accumulated a bankroll pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah, it seems like from reading the book that risk taking was something quite well suited to his personality. Would you agree? 
A hundred percent. Yeah, everyone you speak to was just completely amazed by his ability to just keep upping size and continually take on more and more risk. And in doing so, uh, it sounds as though it made management a little bit nervous at times. <laughs> There's a lot of anecdotes about you know him sort of butting heads with uh, the Rossies and and stuff because he constantly wanted bigger and bigger limits. And they were in a bit of a quandary because on the one hand, the whole business model was kind of predicated on finding people like Nav that could get to a big enough size. And then he was obviously paying a percentage of his profits to, you know, to, to the firm. So they wanted him to get big. They wanted him to be profitable. But if he got too big, you know, there was a, a kind of risk to the actual <laughs> existence of the firm. So it was just so it was just, but he got, you know, he got incredibly big very, very quickly. And, and part of, you know, you could see that in the way that he is because money just didn't really mean anything to him other than as a way of keeping score of his trading improvements. So he didn't buy fancy clothes. He, you know, he, he bought a moped that he used to drive into the office and he apparently used to fall off it all the time and used to sometimes come into the office <laughs> with his helmet still on his head. Um, and, it, you know, if if me or you are doing it, Aaron, you know, suddenly you've got a mortgage to pay or, you know, you, you've you got debts to pay off or you've got your family to consider. But Nav just didn't really have a lot of that stuff. So if he lost a huge amount of money, it didn't really make any difference to him. He was living at home in his parents' house. He didn't really have any desire material for material goods. And so, he, you know, he would lose huge amounts of money one day and nobody would even know about it because his demeanor just didn't really change. And as a, as a trader, you tell me, but I would imagine that is a huge, huge asset to have. Yeah. The mental game is a huge part. I mean, majority of traders will tell you that. So what products was he trading? You, you did mention index futures. Was he trading index futures the, the whole time he was there with Futex? Yeah, so he started out trading a few stocks before he even joined Futex. That's how he kind of got into trading. And then when he got there, he was trading index futures. I believe it was predominantly FTSE at that point, FTSE futures. Um, and then he kind of almost outgrew that market. Like he got to the point where he was trading hundreds of lots. And so he took a decision that he wanted to get into a bigger market where his trades wouldn't be noticed as much, where they would be absorbed by the market more easily. Um, so he switched to S&P uh, E-minis. Um, so at that point, he starts coming into the office at, you know, one o'clock, two o'clock and trading through, uh, you know, through US trading hours. Um, and that was his bread and butter thereafter. Like he did trade other things. Um, he traded the DAX. And there's a good anecdote in uh, in my book and i'll let your your readers find it for themselves but he uh he found a really good opportunity to trade the dax which has got ties to another sort of notorious financial rogue trader but most of the time he was trading s p e-minis okay and what did he build his bankroll up to while he was at futex like by the time he came to leave there um how much cash did he walk away with so he left in about 2008. Um, he basically sort of outgrown that sort of model because he was so successful that he was just giving away too much money to Futex and he was paying commissions on his round trips. And if you're making like, you know, at that point he was making, say, fifty to to $100,000 a day on a good day, he's giving away $5,000 uh, to ten thousand dollars just in commissions um so he sort of got fed up with futex um and he ended up leaving in 2008 and went somewhere else and at that point uh he had about two million dollars uh, built up but yes very quickly after leaving he had his best year during the uh, 2008 financial crisis do you know what he made that year yeah, so so the, again, like I sort of detail the the biggest trades of his career, if you like, and, and one of those that I talk about in the book is in November two thousand and eight. Um, the uh, I think it's the S and P five hundred, maybe it's the Dow. Is it was it a record low or maybe a decade uh, low um, because of everything that had been going on, the collapse of Lehman and all that stuff, um, and then he 
ca- uh, yeah, he decided that he would uh, just take a long position, unusually for him. He wasn't scalping. It wasn't a short-term position. He just went uh, very big, uh, long. Um, and, you know, he timed it perfectly. And over the next course of the next week or so, he kept adding to his position. And I think uh, US markets went up by something like 19% in a week. And his bankroll went from like $2 million to $11 million. Yeah, over the course of that year. That's pretty serious. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and so, yeah, amazing. And there's a great quote in the book from somebody else that was sort of sitting near him at the time. And they were sort of saying, you know, a lot of people think it's gambling, but it's almost like the opposite of gambling because he knew, because all of the press at the time was talking about the fact that the US were going to have to initiate these bailouts and that, uh, you know, it can't be allowed to continue. And so the writing was on the wall. And the analogy that they use is it's like having two aces in poker. Like, you know that the market's going to have to go up and everyone's talking about it. But have you got the balls to put everything you've ever earned into that trade? And that's exactly what Nav did. And so, he, you know, he really reaps the benefits and that set him up to then become the trader that he did. Yeah. Uh, and again, that just sort of goes back to his ability to just take on a lot of risk. Yeah. I made note of uh, there was a, a I think it was a quote from Nav, or maybe someone had mentioned it to you, or it came out later in the trial, etc. Um, but something along the lines of he made the bulk of his wealth in no more than twenty days, spread across his trading career. I thought that was really interesting and and something worthwhile highlighting, which kind of ties in here. Yes, yeah. So Nav's strategy was principally to go short uh, the market at, in a falling market. And then get out quickly and keep getting in and out, you know, during highly volatile periods when markets were falling. So if you look, he made his first million was in, uh, I think it was January 2008, um, during a period of real turmoil. Then in November 2008, obviously, famously, uh, you know, during May 6th, 2010, in the flash crash, he made a million dollars that day. Um, And then he had his best day. In August of 2011, and again, it was like a record fall in markets, like markets had fallen 5% in a day or something. And he made, if you can believe this, he made $4 million in his bedroom in a day. And one of the things we haven't really talked about yet, (laughs) uh, and to be fair, you know, we should talk about is that it wasn't just that he was sort of brilliant at scalping the market, although he was brilliant at doing that, but he also... By 2009, 2010, had started on this route of uh, of really majorly spoofing the market as well. Right. Let me just jump in here because that's something I definitely want to get into. But I did want to ask you a question before that. And it, it was almost like from reading the book, it seemed like there was a pivotal point uh, where Nav kind of changed a little bit, where he became convinced um, that he could identify and he was seeing other market participants that were just blatantly cheating in the market. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. I mean, that was, uh, for me, it was like an amazing find because that had never been talked about. Nav had never talked about it. It was never anywhere. But I managed to track down that he had um, an account on one of the major uh, trading forums. And he was really, he's quite funny on there. Like you'll see in the book, but he's a pretty sort of cheeky kind of like, borderline offensive character <laughs> to, to other traders. But at some point in 2007, he basically puts on this trading forum exactly what he thinks of the market and also exactly what he plans to do about it. But it's quite amazing to actually see it because it's two years before he even sort of built the machine, if you like, the, the algorithm that he would go on to use to sort of spoof to such devastating effect. Uh, he sort of lays out on this forum his plans to uh, – to do exactly that. And if anyone was really paying attention, maybe they could have stopped him. But Yeah, let's speak about the software that he had developed because this is kind of where the spoofing, I think, began to come into uh, his trading career, if you will. Yes. Tell me a little bit about the software that he had developed, his intentions in developing it. And also, if you could, this is something I found particularly interesting um, and was quite surprised to actually see this in the book, uh, was the actual functionality of that software he had developed. Like there were several kind of 
triggers that did certain things. So if you could just describe some of the functionality of the, the software he had developed and his intentions in doing so, that would be interesting to hear. It sort of evolved over time. Uh, the first sort of iteration of it was something that the US authorities would later call an, a layering algorithm. And it was pretty straightforward. Uh, what it would do is uh, it would place large blocks of orders, like you could specify the amount of uh, ticks away from the current best bid. So he would place blocks of orders, usually four, five, and six price points away from the current best bid, and they would sit there, and there would be very large orders, like you know, 600 lots on each price point. Um, and then the functionality that he sort of uh, designed and got someone else to create for him was such that every time the price moved, higher or lower, the this sort of block of sell orders would move in lockstep, so they would never get any closer to the current price and would therefore never be hit. And what that did in a quite a rudimentary way is just add huge amounts of selling pressure you know, to, to the market. And if you imagine the algorithms are looking and suddenly seeing that the amount of sell orders at those price levels is significantly higher than the amount of buyers or whatever, then they'll react to that. And then simultaneously to doing that, he would also be just shorting the market, waiting for it to go down a couple of ticks and then exiting his position. So it was almost like, a, you know, I sort of use the analogy of a sort of turbine in the book, but um, a lot of people are sort of surprised that he could have such an impact, but he would do it for short periods of time. Like he would do it in a burst of five minutes or 10 minutes when the market was already falling and it would just add to the downward pressure in the market. Um, and he would be in and out so quickly that he wasn't sort of relying on the market to fall several percent or anything. He would just get in and out after a few ticks, but he was trading such big size at that point, you know, hundreds of lots, uh, up, you know, going up over time, it went up, but so that, you know, that's still a very, very profitable strategy. There was also something about this software. Uh, there was all the functionality of it is actually covered in the book. Uh, but there was one part where if there was another order added to the queue, uh, his, his order would increase by one lot so that it would send him to the back of the queue. Uh, what was his intentions in doing something like that? Because normally the the fight is to get to the front of the queue, but he was intentionally moving his orders to the back of the queue and wanted to be last in queue. Uh, was that, again, just part of his intent to spoof the market? It was, yeah. So basically, over time, the kind of original algorithm that he built becomes slightly less effective as other market participants become more sophisticated and as HFT you know, really kind of starts dominating the market, you know, they, other participants suss out fairly quickly that if there's this sort of price, if there's a load of sell orders that are like miles away from the current price, they're not going to take that as much into consideration. So Nav realized that in order to really sort of trick other market participants, he needed to place orders right near the current price. So what he then started doing is he invented this thing that he called back of the book, whereby he would place a bunch of orders, usually at one or two prices above the best bid. Um, and what would happen, as, as you rightly point out, is every time a new order arrived behind his orders, his algo would automatically <clears throat> increase his order by one lot. And because of the CME's system, what that would do is just send his orders automatically to the back of the queue. Mm. And because it's such a busy marketplace, by putting that on, that meant that his those big orders that were having downward pressure on the market were constantly being sent to the back of the queue and never, ever being hit. And so, again, what he would do is at the same time as doing that, he would enter a genuine short position, wait for the market to sort of tick down a couple of ticks and then get out again and switch, you know, switch the algos off. I was lucky enough to speak to, to some of the investigators that investigated his case. And they said that basically Nav was kind of amazing because he had so many 
strategies <laughs> so, like so many nefarious strategies so he would do this thing where he would place all these big orders away from the market he would do this other thing with the back of the book so they were closer to the price point and he would also do like manual spoofs so he would flash 2000 orders uh just for you know a second or two um and it was all just designed really to to trick the automated algorithmic traders into supply and demand in the market for long enough that the market moved and he could make a small profit. Right. Let, let me ask you this, Liam, because you spoke to a lot of people in putting this book together. Um, from the people you spoke to who were kind of in the know, who, who understood what it means to really spoof the market, did they say anything about how effective it actually is? <laughs> I mean, there's different points of view on that and i would say that it becomes less effective over time but you know it was sufficient for nav to make a huge amount of money uh, as a sort of bedroom trader and if you look at i don't you know if you look at recent um news out of the u.s department of justice they find uh, and gone after traders from the biggest HFT shops like Tower Research and Jump. Uh, they've, you know, they've got this big case at the moment where all these JP Morgan metals traders are being uh, criminally charged for running sort of spoofing schemes for a long time. Um, you know, you're talking sort of dozens and dozens of traders now that have been criminally charged with spoofing. Um, so I would say that it that it works. <laughs> it's hard though. You know, at the end of the day, you've got to have the capital that if you get it wrong, you've got to take that bath and, you know, Nav did everything he could to sort of mitigate that. Yeah. And Nav did receive, before the flash crash occurred, Nav actually received some letters or some warnings is maybe a better word from the exchange or regulators. Like his activity had sort of shown up on their radar somehow. Yeah. So, so one of the things about Nav's story, which uh, engenders a lot of sympathy with him, is that he felt like not only did he complain on the forum about what was going on in the market and what he was seeing, but he complained to the CME all the time and to the point where he was like a total pain in their ass. Like he would phone them up and he would threaten them and he would, was just so pissed off because he saw spoofing all the time. But because the CME didn't do anything about it, they didn't take him seriously, he just took the view in the end, well, fuck it, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. And he did. Um, and you're right. Like, they did send a couple of warnings. Um, and then much later in the story, after he's sort of been identified, then, yeah, they did the CFTC, you know, the actual regulator did start to write to him as well. But it was pretty uh, sparse, to be honest. And, and I feel a lot of sympathy for that because – if the CME was doing its job, they would have noticed what he was doing pretty quickly, told him to cut it out. They could have given him a fine or whatever, but they didn't do any of that. And so, you know, he ends up going from nothing to criminally charged. Yeah. Because they because they there was just no oversight at that point in time. Let's jump forward a little bit and speak about the actual flash crash event. So this is the flash crash which occurred in 2010. Let me just ask you this question straight out. Can he be blamed for causing the flash crash? Almost definitely not. Um, one of the things that I try to do as a journalist is not overstretch my kind of capabilities and, and try and sort of get into the data and uh, kind of economic analysis of this because that's not my <laughs> field. But what I did do is talk to as many people as I could from all different perspectives, including lots of finance professors, including the people that actually investigated the flash crash. And, you know, there, there's a very wide dispersal of views. One thing I would say is that at the time in 2010, there was already an investigation into the flash crash. And what they found is that this uh, big US pension fund had placed a massive, massive um, non-price sensitive sell order into the market uh, in an already extremely volatile day. Um, and that was exactly at the point at which the market began to fall. So there was already a sort of major, major trigger. And if you look at the macro conditions that day, it was right in the heart of the Eurozone crisis. There was like Greeks was, um, you know, had suddenly received a bailout. And so there were all these 
uh, sort of uh, swirling conditions that made the markets extremely volatile. And I think the most you can really say about NAV is that he was a big participant in in that marketplace. He did uh, place a huge amount of spoof orders that day, uh, but no one's been able to sort of definitively prove that he was a major contributory factor. Um, I think in the book, I use this sort of analogy of like, you know, how do you turn around and say what caused the First World War or something? Like you could read, a, a, you know, thousands of history books and they all come up with different factors depending on how they sort of view the world. And I think the NAV was undoubtedly a factor in the same way that anyone that was trading significant size is a factor in a market at any point in time. But nobody successfully sort of demonstrated that without him, there wouldn't have been a flash crash. And and for what it's worth, I strongly believe the flash crash would have happened anyway. Yeah. I mean, markets are such complex systems and there's just so many factors to, to be able to point it, to pinpoint a single cause. I just don't know how you could. Well, yeah, the only thing I'd say on that, to give them, uh, to be fair to the US authorities, they were always quite careful to say he only helped cause or he contributed or something. Okay. Um, But inevitably, you know, if you put that in your press release, then he becomes known as the flash crash trader. And, you know, I think that they, they tried to almost use the flash crash to get more publicity for this case. And they probably didn't need to do that. They should have just charged him with spoofing and included the fact that he was spoofing on the day of the flash crash rather than sort of pinning the flash crash on him, um, as you say, which, you know, was very, very hard for them to be able to actually stand up. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That large fund, and you you speak about this at length in the book, uh, which was selling like billions of dollars worth of uh, E-mini futures that day. And they were using some sort of algorithm to do so, like almost like a volume participation algo. It would match the volume which was being done um, up until they'd sold the quantity that they needed to get sold. How did they escape the hot seat through all this? Well, because there's no criminality for being stupid. <laughs> you know, ultimately, it was a really, really dumb trade. As you say, it was entirely volume sensitive and they didn't put a price floor they'd basically just put this order through of like we want to sell seventy five thousand, i think off the top of my head e-minis uh, and they were going to sell them at a rate of nine percent of the volume in the market at that point in time <laughs> but obviously volume went absolutely through the roof because it was the this, this sort of market crash so they were just like selling 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 into a falling market and there seemed to be no real traders there that pulled the plug and said hang on a minute let's cut this order so they did, you know, they got some criticism for it and they obviously lost some money, but yeah, they didn't, other than sort of maybe a bit of embarrassment, they uh, certainly didn't face any sort of criminal charges or anything. Yeah. Before we get into the the criminal charges, et cetera, which Nav found himself up against, this is something I was totally unaware of before reading the book, is Nav actually had interests or uh, investments in various businesses I don't expect you to talk about all of them, but could you just tell us about one of those businesses which he had invested in? Like, what did he do with his his trading profits? Yeah, so so one of the most intriguing elements of this whole story is that Nav never told his friends or family how much money he was making. He, you know, he's a he's quite a humble kind of eccentric guy. And he took the view that if other people knew about it, they would treat him differently. So he basically just kept it to himself. And at some point his accountant notices that he's making millions and millions of dollars uh, and says, Hey, Nav, you know, you should meet some of my friends. They can help you invest your money. Um, And so he gets introduced to, it's no exaggeration to say like a queue of you know, salivating (laughs) criminals who basically see him coming. You know, there's this guy who's making vast amounts of money, but he's got nowhere, no use for it, you know. And and if you tell him, Nav, you know, we can get you a fantastic interest rate, then he's sort of willing to do it. Because on the one hand, he's incredibly gifted at trading, but on the other, he's quite a sort of naive individual. Um, He's not very worldly. Um, and so 
there's a whole litany of these characters, but one of the main ones is this sort of Mexican uh, entrepreneur called Jesus, who kind of comes into the picture and he's got this scheme uh, and he offers Nav and other participants 11% guaranteed returns per year. Um, and if you can imagine at that point, I think the interest rates, UK sort of base rate was 0.5% or whatever. So it's pretty hard to guarantee someone 11% uh, returns. But this is what this guy did. He's just this kind of amusing character who used, who's got a kind of Russian wife called Ekaterina. He lives in Zurich. He drives a, a, a uh, like a BMW electric car and he's got a, a like a chauffeur driven town car. And he, you know, he looks the part and Nav ultimately, you know, without sort of giving the end away, but ends up giving almost everything he ever makes to, to this guy and people like him. How is this guy guaranteeing a, an interest rate of 11%? What was he doing with the money? That particular investment was around something called trade finance. So basically, um, and I might be, you know, this is sort of from memory, but essentially, say you've got a situation where, you know, a country wants to buy a huge amount of coal and you've got a coal producer, but to actually get the coal to the country and for them to sort of verify that it's the right amount and to actually make the payment is a process that can take several months. So you get these companies that sort of sit in the middle, get things called letters of credit or letters of guarantee from both sides to confirm that subject to these conditions, they will do the deal. And then they kind of step in and put their money in um, as like a stopgap. And then they'll take a sort of cut of the profits. And so he based this guy, Jesus um, Alejandro Garcia basically told Nav that he was this kind of Mexican uh, wealthy magnate from a family of very successful Mexican businessmen. And he knew governments and companies around the world uh, and therefore he could make these connections. And so the idea was that all this money would be used to kind of facilitate what they called the global trade of physical commodities. So that was the pitch. But, you know, you and I know that there's no such thing as as risk-free returns. Um, and if there is, then why the hell are you opening up that opportunity to other people, you know? And how much money did Nav put with him? So by the end, uh, he put with him 45 million pounds. So something like $65 million, at least at the point uh, where I write about it in the book. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a sort of a bit of a tragic element to the whole story, really. But basically what happens is that investors like Nav kept getting their interest. And so he had a huge amount of money. And before that, because interest rates were so low, he was getting hardly anything, hardly any returns on his money. And suddenly this guy comes along and, you know, Nav puts in a smaller amount, then a bigger amount, and he keeps getting these returns. So each quarter he's getting like interest of, uh, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Uh, so he's, he starts to trust the guy and he gets paid reliably for three years. Um, and, you know, not to give too much away, but Nav, once he gets arrested, uh, has to come up with bail. And the bail is set at five million pounds based on how much he's made over time. And so five million pounds shouldn't be too much of a problem for Nav, but he finds quite quickly that he can't get the money. Mm, it's tied up. Yeah. So not only has he just been arrested, but it's only at that point that he starts to realize maybe all of the money that he's been saving all this time isn't as safe as he thought it was. Yeah. So what led authorities to identify Nav of wrongdoing? Like, why was he ultimately arrested? Well, yeah, so that's another interesting, interesting side to this whole thing. So it wasn't that the regulators or even the exchange noticed what he was doing, even though he was at points uh, placing orders of like the 2000 lot maximum and then pulling them, nobody noticed. Um, the only reason he got caught, and I think I will leave this for people to read it because it's a really interesting sort of side story, but there's another guy who, you know, like a lot of your listeners, was a, is a day trader and he um, was uh, using a kind of sort of combination of 
of point and click trading and, and algorithms. And he was developing his algos and he was back testing his recent um, kind of upgrades to his trading system. And he decided randomly to do it on May 6, 2010. And then when he did that, he noticed that there was all these huge blocks of oversized sell orders that were appearing and then disappearing, you know, four or five ticks away from the market throughout that whole day. And then he, at this point in time, the US had just enacted the whistleblower program. So you could get paid to blow the whistle between 10 and 30% of whatever the CFTC or the DOJ end up getting. Uh, if they uh, prosecute someone, you can get as a whistleblower. So he saw an opportunity. Um, and so that's how, and and so, you know, from there, the investigation starts. So, you know, it was, it was a, it was another day trader that, that shopped him basically. Obviously there's a, there's a lot more around that. Um, I'm interested though, just to ask you, uh, and I, I'm not sure if you have the answer for this, but how much influence did the larger um, HFT firms have in pushing forward this case also? Like once it began to get a little bit momentum, um, did they become more involved in this? Because obviously what NAV was doing in the market was upsetting uh, their systems, I presume. Yeah, it's a really interesting, interesting point. You know, so there's a lot of people that believe that spoofing is a kind of reasonable reaction to the growth of high frequency trading. And I kind of write about it in the book. But if you imagine HFTs are essentially just monitoring the order book, looking for signals that the market is temporarily going to fall or rise, and then essentially using, you know, very fast technology to try and get to the front and, and capitalize on that trade. What NAV was doing is saying, well, if all they're doing is essentially front running, I'm going to fuck with the signals and, and confuse the algorithms. And that's what he did. And, and so you're absolutely right. The HFT firms, particularly Citadel, um, ended up being like the regulators' eyes and ears in the market. And they're the sort of regulators' best friends because people like Nav, and there's another guy called Igor Oystatcher, uh, this kind of Russian huge day trader, um, also active in the E-mini. And basically, uh, the, the likes of Citadel end up being witnesses in the prosecution of individuals like Nav. Um, because they were the ones that were getting hit. So there's a sort of slight irony there that these firms that are billion-dollar firms that a lot of people think are very controversial anyway and that are the subject of books like Michael Lewis's Flash Boys because a lot of people think, well, you know, what value are they adding to the market are the ones that end up benefiting when guys like Nav get taken down. So what was Nav actually charged for? Like there were there was something like 22 different charges, I think. Yeah, so Nav was kind of unlucky in the sense that he was only the second individual ever to be charged with spoofing because spoofing was a brand new law that was brought in or anti, you know, anti-spoofing law was brought in with Dodd-Frank and so at the time they needed to charge him with as much as possible because they didn't know what was going to stick. So they charged him with wire fraud uh, and they charged him with market manipulation and with spoofing. Uh, and they've all got sort of different requirements to, to prove. But spoofing is quite a sort of blanket thing, which is like you're not supposed to place any orders that you intend to cancel. And uh, at that point, it was completely unproven. And there was a lot of people that were saying, well, that's ridiculous because if you place a stop loss, for example, or an iceberg, all of these things, you know, you hope or intend to cancel them. So, Throughout the, his case, was there any consideration given to the fact that he was also an incredibly talented trader? Like here we've spoken about, you know, he was in trouble for spoofing, etc. cetera. Yes. Like sure, that probably helped to some extent. But I think there's also no denying that he was just a brilliant trader. Well, I, you know, I am a fan, a fanboy of Nav, really. Like, by the end of the book, I was just totally and utterly on board. Not to say that what he did, you know, he, he shouldn't have got caught for, but ultimately he was just an incredibly gifted and talented trader. And, it, you know, I, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, but it's so hard 
as a day trader away from like a trading desk at a major institution to consistently make money. And Nav just did it from, from the word go. And even when he decided to sort of go over to the dark side and build this spoofing algorithm, it was kind of genius. Like the way that I see it was like, he kind of saw a flaw in what the algos were doing. And he, he, off his own back with no sort of prior training designed his own algorithm to fight back against them. And it worked incredibly, incredibly well. So, you know, I hope that readers of the book will come away with that sense of like, even though what he did was ultimately illegal by the letter of the law, he was a fucking great trader and a really unique talent in the markets. Yeah. And was his broker ever scrutinized for, you know, um, a lack of oversight, I guess? Well, I think they got away with it a bit because his broker was MF Global. And in 2011, MF Global, I think it was 2011, was declared bankrupt. His sort of most egregious or biggest trading periods of time was with, was MF, was with MF Global. Um, but it's definitely true that his brokers were pretty slack. And even sort of knew what he was doing, uh, anecdotally, it seems like. But basically just were like, this guy is just absolutely creaming commissions for them. So they just sort of shut up and (laughs) let him get on with it. I think there's been a couple of examples now in the US where brokers have actually been uh, charged alongside traders. Um, And the other, other sort of corollary point on that is that NAV even though he came up with the designs for these algorithms, wasn't a computer programmer. So he, he had to hire developers to build the machines for him. And, and again, it sort of raises similar questions. Like if you build um, an algorithm that's so obviously going to be used to, to spoof the market or do any kind of manipulation, to what extent are you aiding and abetting that? Are you part and parcel of that? Or is that just the responsibility of the trader? And that's a question that comes up in the book as well. Yeah. So Nav was arrested. He was extradited to the US and uh, went on trial over there. What was the outcome? So he, yeah, so he, he was uh, arrested over here in 2015. He was extradited to the US and at that point, I think it was pretty obvious that the evidence against him was was pretty strong. And I know a lot of people are very sympathetic for Nav and think that he's a scapegoat and what have you. And I am definitely sympathetic with that view myself. But what they need to realize is that Nav had communicated with various programmers in such an explicit way. So he was, he put in various emails. I want my spoofs (laughs) to work better. Or I keep getting hit in my orders. My spoofs aren't working. So as a case, he was kind of uh, screwed, really, because the evidence was of intent was so strong. So he pleaded guilty in 2016. But what happens then is pretty remarkable is that his lawyer struck a deal with the US Justice Department that he would assist them with their understanding of the markets and with other ongoing cases. And depending on how much of a good job he did, they uh, would take that into consideration when he was sentenced. So he had... So you have this amazing, amazing section in the book where Nav basically sits down with various kind of members of the FBI and U.S. prosecutors and basically explains to them how HFT works, what spoofing looks like, what the order book is. And they're kind of sitting there like completely clueless uh, and they get this schooling from Nav. And that ends up forming the sort of bedrock of their understanding of, of this type of trading. And so since then, it's no exaggeration to say off the back of that, all of these prosecutions in the US have been helped by NAV's intelligence that he provided them. So anyway, in answer to your question, only very recently, earlier this year, he went back to Chicago and was uh, sentenced, but he ended up only getting a year of um, house arrest. So at one point, he was staring down the barrel of like decades in jail, but because he was so helpful to them, and not only that, because he was also quite a vulnerable character, he was diagnosed with Asperger's, he still lives at home with his parents, he hasn't got any money, so they kind of took a lot of, they, they took some sympathy, um, uh, you know, they, they, they felt sorry for him in that respect, and he was so helpful to them that they just gave him a year of, uh, of house arrest, which is kind of ironic, 
that we're now sitting here under house arrest ourselves. You know, Nav's timing <laughs> as ever was impeccable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thankfully he didn't go to jail because that's, uh, I think that's way too extreme for something like this. Um, and as I said earlier, there's so much more to the story than what we've covered here. There's much, much more. Let's leave it at that, Liam. Anyone who's listening to this and is interested in reading the book, uh, you can find it at chatwithtraders.com slash Liam, uh, L-I-A-M. That'll take you directly to Flash Crash on Amazon. Uh, Liam, you're also on Twitter. If someone wants to follow you, what's your handle? Uh, it's Liam Vaughan BBG. Okay, very good. All right, Liam, we'll leave it there. I know there was so much more we could have spoken about, but I want to leave some surprise for for readers of the book. So uh, I appreciate you making the time and I also want to thank you uh, greatly for going to all the trouble to, to make this um, and put it all together. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders. Chat with Traders.